Well, good evening. Hope that you're doing well this week. Hope that you have been in God's word and in prayer and walking with God, uh, standing against temptation in your life, and that you're just living the successful and victorious Christian life. And we all have failures and we all fall, but I hope that you're walking with God and enjoying your Christian life. I hope that you're being provided for, that God's taking care of all of your needs. We hear every day about you know, the problems in the world, in the job market, a lot of people unemployed, a lot of people struggling, people losing their jobs a lot. So uh, I also heard recently as well about a, a guy that was fired from an ice cream shop because he didn't work on Sundays. <laughs> he just didn't do Sundays at all. So anyway, I uh, hope that you are, if you are employed right now, if you've got a good job that you're thankful. Uh, and uh, so let's open together in a word of prayer and then we will open up God's word together. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for all of your goodness and blessings. You tell us uh, multiple times in your word <clears throat> that your thoughts toward us are more than the sand of the sea. Your desires for us are our desires of good and joyful uh, things. And I pray that you would help us to be walking as joyful Christians in a dark world. Help us to be shining a bright light. Help us to be making people desire Christ and to make people thirsty for the gospel. I pray that you'd bless our time in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, I want to start with a passage in Isaiah chapter 59 this evening. Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 12. I want to read about a scenario with the nation of Israel just before the Babylonian captivity. The God gives a description of the way life was spiritually. And we see some parallels, uh, many parallels between the nation of Israel uh, in some of their low times and our world and our nation today. Isaiah chapter 59, I want to start reading in verse 12. It says, For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. And judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth. And he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness it sustained him. This is the condition of the nation of Israel before God has to send them into the Babylonian captivity. It says that they had turned away from God and no one cared about truth. It says there was no one, the Lord saw it and he was displeased that there was no judgment and there was no man and he wondered that there was no intercessor. What a bleak statement, what a bleak assessment of the spiritual condition of the nation that God is looking but it says that he is almost astonished. He wonders at the fact that there's no intercessor, nobody that's standing up and helping and doing anything about the situation. In Ezekiel, there was a similar situation. By the way, we see this in our nation as well. So many times you can flip on the TV or find on the internet and other places where wickedness is proclaiming itself bold-faced, open-throated, to the top of its lungs. And you look around and sometimes you're wondering, who is going to say something? Who's going to do something and stand up against this wickedness? And it seems like sometimes that there's nobody. And if there is someone, they are quickly silenced or ignored. In Ezekiel, there's a similar situation. One of the saddest verses and passages in the Bible uh, Ezekiel chapter 22 and verses 30 and 31. And just before we get to verse 30, the previous verses 
say that as God looks at the nation, the priests have failed, the princes have failed, the prophets have failed, and the people of the land have failed. Four consecutive verses before verse 30. You see four groups of people that God looks here and here and here and here, and, and there's nobody that is doing right among the people that should be doing right. And here's verse 30, Ezekiel 22, 30. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads saith the Lord God. God said he looked and he desired and he yearned for someone to stand up and stand for truth in the land. But there was no one. Somebody that would be a wall, it says to make up a hedge or a barrier between God and the land that his wrath wouldn't destroy the land. But he couldn't find one person that would stand up and make a difference in the world. One person that would stand up on the behalf of the people and say, God, don't destroy them because I love them and I want to stand for truth before them. I've entitled our message this evening, Stand for Truth. And so there are two situations there where God is looking and he can't find anyone that would be different from the world, to find anyone that would be like him before the world. And if you would take your Bibles to Jude in verse 3, the book of Jude, next to the last book in the New Testament, and here we see an admonition. We see another need, because as Jude, it says, when I started to write, I was going to write about this, and then the Holy Spirit laid it on my heart that this was the great need of the hour. So Jude in verse 3, it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Very quickly, I want to break down a couple of the words and phrases in that verse, in, in that uh, phrase at the end, uh, to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The Greek word for earnestly, those two words, earnestly contend, are the same Greek word, and the word is epagonizomai. You hear the word agonize, the word agony. In there, and the Greek word epagonizomai means to struggle for, uh, and we, as I said, we get the word from this. It means to to really fight with all that you have, to agonize in your struggle for something, and it says that we are to earnestly contend for the faith, and that word faith there doesn't really it doesn't mean to believe, but it means the facts of what are to be believed. Or we can think about it as the body of doctrine or the body of truth that God has given to us. And that's what we see next. It says, the uh, contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. That phrase, once delivered, means that it's once for all. God did this one time. He gave it one time for all. And it means to entrust, that God has entrusted. Who is he entrusted? It says, is once delivered unto the saints. God has given to us, to believers, to those that are redeemed and saved. He's given to us the doctrines and the truths of God's word as an entrustment for us to take and to share with the world, and to guard, to make sure that they never change. That's one of the important things. It'd be like somebody that's going to go on a long trip, 
and they, they give something into your care. While I go on this trip, I want you to take this and I want you to guard it and protect it and make sure it doesn't get stolen and make sure nobody ruins it. Make sure that when I get back, it is exactly the way that I left it. And we as Christians don't have the right to do whatever we want to with this truth. The illustration that I've used before is with something like a, an expensive car. Somebody gives you a Ferrari or loans it to you while they go out of town. You take care of the Ferrari. And when they leave, you think, you know what? This red Ferrari, red is just not really my color. It's too bright. It catches the eyes of the police officers. They're going to they're gonna target me and pull me over, try to give me tickets. So I think I'll change the paint job. I'll put a nice camouflage on it. And, uh, you know, I don't have the right to do that because I don't own the Ferrari. I'm just a steward. I'm taking care of it. It's been entrusted to me. It's been delivered into my care, but it belongs to somebody else. And the word of God, the truths of God, the faith of Christianity is a body of doctrine that God has entrusted us with. And we are on this earth for a limited amount of time. And one of our jobs as Christians is to make sure that that body of truth stays the same uh, before the world, that we don't allow people to corrupt it. We don't allow people to modify and change it. And there are many Christians, uh, many liberal believing Christians that uh, it doesn't matter that we hold on to what God gave. We can modify, we can be wishy-washy on some things. So I want to talk about what this is and what it is not that we are to stand for. God wants us to fight for whatever this is. He wants to fight for it tooth and nail. These are non-negotiable. God does not allow for any modification. God doesn't allow for anything to be watered down that he gave to oppose, or I'm sorry, to appease those that think they're a little bit too narrow or old-fashioned or fanciful. You know, it's just fairy tales in the Bible. So maybe we can, you know, fudge on them. We can cut some corners on things. God gave his word just right. It is perfect, and he wants us to treat it that way in the world. So what is this truth that we should stand for? Remember that time when Pilate when Jesus is standing before him, when he asks that question? This is John chapter 18, verse 37. And 38, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? When he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Jesus says, the reason I came to the earth is to bear witness to the truth. The truth is the most important thing. I came to speak of that. And Pilate says, what is truth? If only Pilate had been there in the previous chapter when Jesus is praying, Listen to what he says in what we often call his high priestly prayer, John 17, verse 17. It says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The word of God that has been given throughout the ages, uh, over a span of about 1,500 years to 40 different people, and was recorded and has been preserved for us today perfectly, that is truth. Whatever God says is automatically truth because he is true and it's impossible for him to lie. And whatever he says is the truth. And whatever he says is important to hold on to and remember and to stand up for and to fight for. And this is the great need throughout all of church history, throughout all the ages. It's a great need today is that truth is fallen in the streets you're not going to find the world standing up for the truth of God. You're going to find them explaining it away or blaspheming it or giving any alternative you can imagine. But God says, I want you to stand for 
this truth. The truths and principles of the Word of God are what we should stand for without apology and even be willing to die for if necessary. And there are many truths in the Bible. There are no unimportant truths in the Bible. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. There's nothing in the Bible that's throwaway, that's a waste of time. But there are some truths that matter more as far as eternal salvation, and we for sure need to be willing to fight for those. As Christians, we need to know which battles are worth fighting and which hills are worth dying on. A lot of Christians are fighting battles that God would not have us to fight. I want to read a couple of passages that talk about some things that God doesn't want us to spend our time arguing about and fighting over. Titus 3 and verse 9 says this, But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. There are a lot of things that people in church, in religious circles, can argue about and fight about. And God says, avoid those things. They are unprofitable and vain. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into many examples of these. Uh, let me give a couple Romans, uh, listen to another passage, Romans 14, verses 1 through 6. It gives us a couple of scenarios that the church would really struggle with. And, God, and Paul, and God through Paul, is telling them, uh, don't spend all your time on these. Romans 14, verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. In other words, you have these dietary questions. What are we allowed to eat? What are we not allowed to eat? What's unclean? What's forbidden? What can we not eat? And so some one person over here can say, oh, you can eat anything you want to. And someone else might say, oh, no, you shouldn't eat meat. Uh, you can only eat herbs. And people argue and fight about their diet. God says, don't waste your time on that. Listen to verse 3. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. So this whole matter about fighting over and arguing over what we're allowed to eat or what we're not allowed to eat, don't worry about it. Uh, if one decides they're not going to eat, leave them alone. If one decides they are going to eat, good, be happy for them. Don't worry about your diets. Look at verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. The Jewish holidays and calendars and feast days. What are we supposed to observe today? What doesn't matter? As Christians uh, in churches today, should we be observing the Sabbath or Sunday? Should we be observing the, all the feasts of the Old Testament? The Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of Pentecost and so forth. Uh, or, you know, any other holiday. You could talk about things like Christmas and Easter, and other holidays, and people get all bent out of shape over the way that some things are or are not observed. And it says, you decide according to your own conscience, and use the word of God, but you decide, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Which one is spiritual? They can both be spiritual. Look at verse 6. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. You know, you think about things like Christmas and Easter. And sometimes, you know, by the way, sometimes you don't know what to say. You can be caught in the middle. 
Uh, if you don't like Christmas, you could either be an atheist or you could be a really spiritual person and say that Christmas is a pagan holiday. So you, you got to be careful who you say Merry Christmas to because you might offend the atheists and you might offend people who are really spiritual. Uh, but somebody could, could say, I love Christmas and I worship Jesus. And the other person could say, oh, I hate Christmas. Christmas is pagan. I don't like Christmas because I love Jesus. And somebody could say, I love Christmas because I love Jesus. And both people can love Jesus. And so don't judge each other. Don't fight and argue about these things. We need to know which battles are worth fighting for. Once you find those battles, we need to earnestly contend for the faith and fight those battles. So many Christians, they spend all their efforts arguing and fighting about politics, about what the other side is doing and how awful it is. Did you see what they did today? Did you see what they're talking about now? Look what's happening with domestic policy or foreign policy. It's horrible what's happening with the economy and with people's jobs. Look how much money is being spent on this and look how much debt we're in. And they get all bent out of shape and they argue and fight and get on social media and trash people and they get anxiety and they get their blood pressure up all over things that in the eternal scheme are just here today and gone tomorrow. Christians are arguing about climate change and uh, energy, you know, fossil fuels and so forth, and sports and the weather, or wearing or not wearing masks, and we're all bent out of shape about vanity. And I believe God is looking down from heaven and thinking, I really wish they cared more about what I really care about. I really wish they cared more about what my heartbeat is in the world. I wish they really cared about the truth, the truth of the gospel, the truth of scripture, the truths of God. We need to, to stand for the truths of salvation first and foremost. Let me mention some of the truths that are involved in the truths of salvation. That there is only one God, the God of the Bible, and he sent his son, Jesus Christ. He has a son. Some people believe that, that there are many gods. No, there's only one God. Some people believe there's only one God, but they don't believe in Jesus. No, the one God has a son named Jesus. And if you don't believe that God has a son named Jesus, then you've got a wrong God. You've got a different God. It's an idol. And this son, Jesus, God sent him to die for the sins of the world. The whole world is in sin. We are all sinners. That's a very important truth to fight for. And God did this because uh, he loves us. And even though we all fall short of his perfection, if anyone believes in Jesus and trusts him for salvation, he will be saved. He will be allowed to live forever in a real place called heaven. But if anyone does not believe in Jesus and call upon him for salvation, he will spend forever in a real place called hell. And all of the truths that I just mentioned are in the Bible. For sake of time, we're not going to break them all down and look at verses. But the Bible supports every one of those statements. And every one of those statements is a truth worth fighting for. Never let uh, any truth of any of those statements get fudged on. Well, you know, God loves us and, you know, he, he loves us so much that, I mean, we're not going to go to hell. There's not even really a hell. You know, there's not even really a devil. You're one of those kooks that believes in those fairy tales. No, it's worth fighting for because the alternative to disbelieve those risks someone's eternal destiny in hell. There are, they, these are often called the five fundamentals of the Christian faith. And they were kind of compiled. They've been in the Bible ever since God wrote it, which God wrote the Bible in eternity past. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Um, but uh, Bible believers got together in the early 1900s and kind of compiled them because there was a lot of liberal theology denying this and that about the Bible. And they came up with five fundamentals of the Christian faith. And I'll mention them. And these are all very important to believe. The Bible supports all these. The inerrancy of Scripture. That all of the Scripture is perfect. If there were any error in the Bible, 
then how would you know where errors are and where they are not? Who's, you know, someone says, well, the Bible is inspired in spots and I'm inspired to spot the spots. You know, sometimes people say, well, uh, some of the Bible, most of the Bible is true, but not all of it. And I know where the errors are. If there's any error, then who knows where anything could be an error. The Bible is inerrant, not just the way that it is given, not the way that it was given, but the way that we have it today. It's been preserved for us. Uh, God's truth is to all generations. So the inerrancy of scripture. Number two, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ that Jesus was born of a virgin. He wasn't just born of a maiden. Ha'alma is the Hebrew word. And sometimes people say, well, it was a young maiden. No, it was a virgin. It was a miracle. And why is this miracle so important? One, it was a sign uh, that God gave. But a really important reason is that everyone is born a sinner because of Adam, because of the sin nature that's passed down through mankind. And, but Jesus was not born of man. He was born of the Holy Spirit. The seed that was placed in Mary was of the Holy Spirit, and that's why he was able to be born perfect. Jesus was sinless in his life. If he wasn't sinless, he wouldn't be qualified to die for our sins. He would have to die for his own sins. So the virgin birth of Christ. Number three, the substitutionary atonement of Christ. This means that when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he died in our place so that we don't have to die. He was a substitute. And what he did was sufficient. It was good enough. We don't have to add to what he did with our good works and with our faithfulness. Uh, the substitutionary atonement of Christ, absolutely vital. Number four is the bodily resurrection of Christ. That Jesus not only died for our sins and was buried, but he rose again. And it wasn't just a spiritual resurrection. He didn't just rise in our hearts and, and he's always with us in spirit. He rose bodily and literally. And that's important because Jesus says the same way I did, he's the first fruits. The same way I rose, you will rise again. And we will all, our flesh will rest in hope if we die before Jesus comes back. And we will rise again and receive glorified bodies and live forever with him in heaven. So the bodily resurrection of Christ is something that's worth fighting for. And number five is the authenticity of the miracles in the Bible. They're not just stories that make us feel good. They're not fairy tales that, that might get us through difficult times that we wish upon a star. We didn't make up the miracles in the Bible. We don't believe them because they make us do it. Do they make us feel good? I hope they do. They give us joy. They give us comfort. Because if God can do that, he can fix our problems. But we believe them because God said it and because they are true. And don't allow anyone to ever rob you of the truth of the miracles of the Bible. You take away the miracles, you take away the power of God. And God can do anything, and he did everything that he said he did in the Bible. There are also many other truths and principles in the Bible that are under attack today that God wants us to believe and to stand for. Right is always right, and wrong is always wrong. There are many social issues in our day where if you were to track them and trace them, the popularity has swung from this side of it to that side of it. And so many people, they don't even know what to believe because the public opinion changes so quickly. Here's an example. Uh, homosexuality in our country, gay marriage. Uh, a 2020 Gallup poll showed that uh, currently about 67% of the population or at least the responders to this poll, uh, said that the government should recognize same-sex marriages. People should be allowed to get married. The government should recognize it and give them provisions and so forth. 67%. Uh, in 1996, it was only 27% that believed that, governments, that the government should recognize same-sex marriage. So in a period of uh, 24 years, we've gone from 27% to 67 percent. Uh, so what should we believe? Should we believe the 27 percent from 1996 or should we believe the 67 percent from 2020? And if you base your truth on polls and public opinion, then you're always going to be searching and wondering and grasping for the next thing. Here's something that you may have noticed shift. 
Uh, I've seen it in my lifetime and the generation before me has said that there's really a shift there too. What's okay to be on TV as far as um, actions or words? What words are okay to say on TV? What words are okay to say out in public in, in, among your friends? Are certain words taboo? Do we have total freedom of speech or you know, should certain things not be allowed to be said? Um, if we just live our lives by polls and by public opinion, uh, what a disaster that is. God does not want us to live that way. Instead, find out what God says about something. Where does he say it? He says it in the Bible. Find out what God thinks and what God says in the Bible and grab onto that because it will never change, because God will never change. God's word, as I said earlier, it, it, his word is settled forever in heaven. It will never change and so have that be your standard of what's right and wrong. Have that be the standard of what you are willing to fight for, of what's really important in life. Don't judge what is right by how many people are on that side. Judge it by the word of God. I love this verse, Romans 3, verses 3 and 4. It says, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou might, mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. What if some people don't believe the Bible? Does that make it not true? God forbid, it says. Let God be true and every man a liar. You just follow what God says. And if public opinion shifts, then it shifts. Let them go over the deep end. Let them go down into the ditch. But God's truth is always true. Truth is always true. Uh, there's a statement where I went to a seminary. One of the, the motto of the seminary is, truth is immortal. What a, an important Truth, what an important statement, that truth lasts forever. And there's a verse that says it in as many words, Second John and verse 2. It says, For the truth's sake which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. The truth will be with us forever. The world can shift and change and fight against the truth and try to jump on top of it and push it down and, and obliterate it. But they will never, because it is truth. It will always last forever. Truth is immortal. And so be on the side of truth when judgment comes down. You don't want to be on the other side. You don't want to be on, on the side that's trying to trample truth in the streets. Because it will rise and it will destroy those that try to silence it. We need to stand for, a wor stand for truth in a world that increasingly wants to silence it. And often have you noticed this, that the fact that the world wants to silence the truth proves that it is powerful and it is real and they are afraid of it. And if there's nothing there, then you can just leave it alone. We don't need to you know, spend all our time trying to talk people out of believing in Santa Claus because Santa Claus is not real. No big deal. If somebody wants to believe in Santa Claus, yeah, whatever. Barney the Purple Dinosaur. But when someone believes something that is real and true and changing, uh, I mean, it's life changing, it will alter their lives. Now we need to do something about that. And when the world says, I hate God, there is no God, there is no God, it shows they believe there is a God. And they're trying to talk themselves, I believe, as well as others out of it. Proverbs 11, verse 21. One day, uh, the judgment will come down. It doesn't matter how many people are on the wrong side. They will still be judged. It says, though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. It doesn't matter if it's tens or hundreds or thousands or billions. It doesn't matter if the whole world, remember the flood, the whole world, 
was against God except for Noah and his family, and they were all destroyed. Though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be punished. And when people follow poles, they follow where hand is joining in hand. Oh, they're unified for this cause. I guess there's something there. That many people can't be wrong. No, they can. But God is never wrong. Stand on the side of God and fight for that truth. The wicked shall not be unpunished. If you take a stand for truth and righteousness, the wicked will try to silence you. They'll try to fight against you and put you out. They did it to Jesus, and Jesus says, if they did it to me, they will do it to you. But the truth will eventually prevail. And so take heart. Don't be discouraged. Don't be weary in well-doing. We need to make a decision in our lives. Do we want to risk censorship and cancellation by the world and then stand before God one day and be praised by him for standing for him? Or, here's the alternative to that, do we want to please men that don't even believe in God, that will spend forever in hell, and then stand before God someday and hang our heads in shame because we were ashamed to stand for his truth. Those are the two options. You either please self, please the world, and, and try to have a self-survival in the world, or you please God, but you're going to stand before God someday. I want to finish with this verse, Mark chapter 8 and verse 38. It says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. One day, everyone's going to stand before God. And if you spent your Christian life ashamed of him and ashamed of his words in this adulterous and sinful generation, it says he will be ashamed of you. But if you stand tall and stand for truth and are willing to be spat upon, you're willing to be mistreated and marginalized by the world. See, I don't care what the world thinks about me. I want to stand for truth. And you will stand before God someday and you will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You'll be able to say like Paul, I have fought a good fight. God wants us to fight. Don't fight about dumb stuff. Don't die on the wrong hill and, and spend all of your effort for vanity, but find the word of God, the truths of God. And it's fallen in the streets in our world. Our world hates God. They want to stamp him out. And God is looking for somebody to stand up for him, to make up the hedge, stand in the gap before him for the land that he would not destroy it. And when he looks, does he find you? Does he find me? Are we willing to stand and fight for truth? Are we willing to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to us? Let's pray together. Lord, we pray for our nation. We live in dark days, but they're not dark because of the political goings on. They're not dark just because people are doing things that we don't like. They're dark because the truths of God are trampled in the streets. And I pray that you would help us, help us as individuals at our jobs, in our neighborhoods, help us as a church, help us as families to know what is important to stand for and have the courage to stand for it. The truths of scripture, the truths of salvation, they are fought against on every front and you have put us here to be light and to stand for truth. Help us to do it boldly. Thank you that you will, you will empower us. You'll be with us. We are not alone. And help us to stand with you for your truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I hope that you go with God this week and walk with him and stand for his truth. God bless you. Thank you for watching today. If you have made a decision to follow God in some way or would like prayer, let us know at flbc at cox.net. We would love to connect with you, pray for you, or send you some resources that can help you in your walk with God. If you would like to know more about how to go to heaven, 
visit us at folbaptist.com slash heaven. If you would like to give financially to support our ministry, you can do so at folbaptist.com slash give. Thank you and God bless you.